for the benefits we want to see as well in the future. Okay, that ends the statement by the Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead on the Agriculture Holdings Review Group report. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12154 in the name of Fergus Ewing on partnership action for continuing employment pace, supporting individuals out of redundancy into employment. I will give a few moments for uh, members to change their seats, um, but I would like to invite members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak button as soon as possible. Thank you. And I call on Fergus Ewing to speak to move the motion, Minister, around 13 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To be made compulsorily redundant is one of the most unpleasant experiences that one can have in life. It can be grim, bruising, and a cause of stress and anxiety. It has often an immediate impact on ability to make ends meet. For the vast majority of people, losing one's income causes real financial problems, but it can also damage one's sense of self-respect and self-esteem. Therefore, it is essential that our government response to redundancy, presenting officer, is as effective as is possible. The Scottish Government's initiative for responding to redundancy situations, Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, or as it's better known, PACE, is, I believe, one of our most effective interventions, and I want to state the evidence to support that claim. Research published in June last year indicated that of those surveyed who had received PACE, resport, PACE support, almost three quarters, 72%, had obtained employment. This compares with the figure of 51% in the 2010 survey. Our research also shows that users are highly satisfied with the package of support that PACE service is delivering. We work closely with our partners, such as the local government and Business Gateway, and when I spoke yesterday with Councillor Stephen Hagan and working also with Hugh Lightbody, they both provided positive feedback across the country about PACE and the staff involved. From April 13 to March 14, PACE supported almost 12,000 individuals. Many members in this chamber, presenting officer across the chamber, have over the past nearly four years contacted me about PACE support for their constituents. One purpose of today's debate is to hear thoughts from members, from all parties, on how we can build on the success of PACE and make it even more successful. The economic climate is, of course, relevant. Employment levels are at an all-time high, and Scotland is the best-performing UK nation across all headline labour market indicators. This will clearly be of help for some of those who lose their jobs through redundancy to enter alternative employment. Of course, however, we also want to minimise the number of people facing redundancy. Our programme for government sets out our commitment to boosting the economy, to building a fair society and tackling inequality. Our business support policies focus on ensuring that businesses can grow and thrive, working to help companies avoid situations where there is a risk of redundancies. Through their account management system, our enterprise agencies, base partners, provide a range of early preventative measures to negate potential closure and alleviate difficulties. Specific measures tailored to the network involve banks helping to raise finance, business organisations, professional bodies and relevant public sector representatives, including working with the UK institutions such as the HMRC and the enterprise agencies. Planning officer operating on a confidential referral basis work in this early prevention field is almost always, and correctly so, behind the scenes and carried out in confidence. When the issue is around making tax payments, we work effectively with HMRC, a PACE partner, which may offer time to pay, a temporary option for viable businesses experiencing short-term difficulties in paying tax due in full and on time. The challenge is to encourage a business to engage early to address potential difficulties before they become Insurmountable. I think Labour have set out this, the need for this function uh, in their amendment, and I, I can assure them and the Chamber that this work is done. It's done well. It's done thoroughly. 
and it's a priority. And we carry out a great deal of work, I do, with partners, especially in local government, the Enterprise Network, to that end. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I, I'm grateful to the Minister for the intervention. Will he agree that there is a case to be made around uh, the forgiveness of Scottish level taxation in those circumstances he describes, as well as in forgiveness or uh, relief on taxes which are, liable, uh, which are due to HMRC? Minister. Um, well, as a lawyer, I think there's a difference between forgiveness and deferral. And what we're talking about here is not really writing off debts by the HMRC, but permitting more time to pay where that's required for cash flow reasons, which, you know, a sudden liquidation or insolvency of a main customer who owes a company a couple of million quid can often trigger a cash flow crisis. Uh, but we, generally speaking, do expect businesses to pay their debts and to do so in full over time. Um, I must stress, presiding officer, that PACE is available for every individual affected by redundancy, not simply those in large-scale redundancies, but every single individual, and perhaps more work can be done to reach out to those companies who make redundant one, two, three, or a handful of people, as well as the headline cases. Now, Skills Development Scotland delivers PACE on behalf of the Scottish Government in conjunction with key partners, including the Department for Work and Pensions. There are 18 PACE teams across the country, 12 in the central belt and south of Scotland and 6 in the Highlands and Islands. SDLs also provide services to those who are unemployed, those in employment through the Employability Fund, which I believe is of the order of £52 million, and flexible training opportunities which offer in-work training. So there's the Employability Fund, which caters for, if you like, the consequences of redundancy at a human level. In 214 to 220 structural funds programmes, 115 million has been allocated to 32 local authorities across Scotland. And, you know, I, I offer this as a, 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 as a, 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 in hope that this will be met with a positive response from my Labour friends that in the light of the fact that there are these two uh, existing public sector substantial provisions to cater for the upshot and the consequences of large scale shocks to parts of the country. 150 million and 52 million, whether there is in fact a need for any resilience fund. Uh, and if, as I suggest, the existing funding deals with the situation adequately, then of course, if my colleagues in the Labour Party argue that there has been any single case where there has been insufficient funding to deal with matters appropriately, then I give my undertaking. I'd be more than happy to discuss that in detail with Mr. MacDonald or his colleagues. Uh, but Scottish Government funds and structural funds, which of course have to be very carefully applied, the EU rules are strict, stringently applied, penalties have been imposed on many cases in other uh, jurisdictions. But these Scottish funds and the SF funds ensure the continuation of employability pipelines and do offer substantial support and backup to local communities. On June the 23rd, 2009, John Swinney established the Ministerial PACE Partnership. It now has 21 organisations together with the Scottish Government overseeing a continuous improvement programme to enhance the operation of PACE. And each PACE response is tailored to meet the needs of the individuals involved. In some cases, there will be time for a planned phase of support to be developed. For example, at Phillips Lighting, working closely with the employer and Unite the Union, the local PACE team delivered a comprehensive programme of support services over seven months. Trade unions play a key role. The STUC is a PACE partner, and I'd like to thank them for their support. Just this morning, speaking at the first of uh, two conferences in Aberdeen, presiding officer, I discussed this with Stephen Boyd and our cooperation in uh, several cases in Scottish Resources, Scottish Coal, Freshlink, Remploy, and other cases where we work closely together and you become to build up an excellent personal working relationship. That is what we have done with the STUC and we hugely value it. Similarly, our colleges across Scotland and other PACE partner form a key and integral part of PACE. Many of the examples of individuals who have received help have received the right help to retrain. And that is because of the opportunities that they've been able to get in part in our colleges. Uh, so the experience shows that the earlier PACE support can be provided to individuals, the more effective that support will be. And I would make a plea to employers that 
whilst there are commercial considerations involved here, the earliest possible notification to PACE of potential redundancy of a formal redundancy period can provide a period of three months for, or even longer, for employees to adjust to the consequences, financial and other, in respect of proposed redundancy. Much of my work, uh, presiding officer, relates to liaising with insolvency practitioners, and my prime concern is to make all efforts to seek a positive outcome to preserve jobs. For example, CityLink. I spoke with the administrators to offer support, uh, but they were of the view that the business could not continue as a going concern. I met with representatives of the RMT in that case, and we subsequently held five PACE redundancy support events across Scotland for affected employees. Another recent case was the West Coast Capital, USC, where both I and my officials had difficulties contacting the parent company. Despite that, we were able to provide some pay support for those being made redundant. So I thank insolvency petitioners for all the support they have given. Uh, I spoke to Derek Wilson of ICAS yesterday. I will be meeting with him and Michelle Mullen of ICAS uh, to discuss further joint working in the next couple of months. No one welcomes insolvency, presiding officer, and the horrendous impact that that can have on individuals and employees. But there are some instances where a positive outcome can emerge. And it's important to recognize that that can happen in a minority of cases. For example, there can be an injection of substantial capital and a much stronger business case for the future. That was what happened in the case of Ferguson shipbuilders and also in the case of Hargreaves taking over from Scottish coal. So, uh, that can lead to a more secure, better, more robust, profitable business going forward, replacing one that was ailing in the past. Across Scotland, I see local authorities and national agencies working together effectively to deliver business support, responding to particular situations. I think this really is a very good example of Team Scotland in action. 21 different bodies acting well together. Uh, sometimes circumstances require the intervention of nat national government. Not in every case, but in some cases. There can be value in intervening directly, and we've established task forces to bring together national and local politicians, public sector agencies, company and workforce representatives. This week, we see the first meeting of the Energy Jobs Task Force, focusing on supporting jobs across the energy sector, including apprentices, with an initial focus on oil and gas, given the current challenges being faced in the sector. And I'm delighted that Lena Wilson, the Chief Executive of Scottish Enterprise, is chairing and personally committed to driving forward that work. And I spoke to her yesterday about that work and will be working closely with her on that. Over the past two years, I've chaired the Scottish Coal Task Force, established in April 13, where two operators, uh, ATH and Scottish Resources Group went into liquidation, resulting in over 700 job losses and significant restoration liabilities. In that case, the work that we did together resulted in around 500 people resuming employment. I think that's not a bad result, given the difficulties and scale of the task. In conclusion, presiding officer, I've mentioned some specific cases, just a few, there are many others, Perhaps if we can turn to them later, or members can talk about them in their contributions about their part of Scotland. But what I would say is this. I'd like to pay tribute to the PACE team, led by Margaret Souter, and to her 18 teams of colleagues around the country. They provide very strong support to people at rough times in their lives. They do so in a human, sympathetic, and effective fashion. Uh, and uh, it is no surprise that that support is genuinely appreciated by the substantial majority of people who are in receipt of their services. Much of the PACE team's work is done under the radar, unseen, unreported, and unappreciated. This debate today is, amongst other things, an opportunity to pay tribute and to give credit to them. In conclusion, presiding officer, I believe that PACE is an excellent example of the Scottish Government working in partnership with all our other parties and bodies to maximise benefit for individuals, for communities, and for Scotland's economic growth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Lewis MacDonald to speak to in Move Amendment 12154.1. Mr MacDonald, nine minutes. Thank you very much. And, uh, President Officer, this debate is timely because the Scottish economy is indeed facing the threat of thousands of job losses 
as a result of the falling price of oil. Partnership Action for Continuing Employment clearly has a part to play in responding to that threat, but pace is not enough on its own. That is why Scottish Labour's amendment today proposes a resilience fund to strengthen the response to economic shocks at a local level. We do, of course, recognise the role of PACE. I echo the Minister's closing comments about the personal qualities uh, of the staff involved in the PACE teams. And we welcome the fact that the Scottish Government has brought forward a debate on a report on PACE uh, published uh, in June of last year. Now, the news release at that time was headlined Scottish Government PACE Initiative five years on and told us that the Scottish Government established the PACE partnership in response to the economic downturn in June 2009. That at first might seem curious, given that the first, review, uh, first year review of Partnership Action for Continuing Employment was published by the then Scottish Executive 14 years ago, and that PACE was actually launched under that name in March 2000. But, but of course ministers know that they did not invent PACE, and that what we are debating today is an initiative which is almost as old as devolution itself. But it is true, as Mr Ewing said, that the PACE partnership has been around in its current form only since 2009, and that the changes made then were more than simply a minor rebranding for PR purposes. <clears throat> Last year's report, for example, highlighted enhancements arising from a continuous improvement programme like a PACE helpline, a new data capture system, an evaluation framework and improved support in a number of fields for people made redundant. Helplines and data capture systems can, of course, be very significant, but the most substantial changes in PACE now, compared with a decade ago, are in who leads the partnership action and in the scope of ambition around continuing employment. PACE, when it was first established, was seen as a tool of economic intervention, bringing together government agencies to protect existing jobs as part of a wider approach to supporting the productive economy. And that's why Labour's amendment today highlights that original remit to identify companies or sectors in difficulty at an early stage, to promote partnership working between public sector agencies and private companies in order to mitigate that difficulty and to avoid job losses. And where that joint working fails to avoid job losses, to work to get people back into employment as early as possible. Because it was about the wider economy, the lead was taken by the enterprise agencies and the real strength of PACE in its first few years was that leadership and delivery were provided by local response teams bringing together the local enterprise company, the local council and the then equivalent of Job Centre Plus. <clears throat> local enterprise companies were of course done away with in the SNP's first term and local response teams are no longer under the aegis of the enterprise agencies, although as the Minister said, PACE still now encompasses uh, business gateway instead. But now it is Skills Development Scotland which leads on the delivery of PACE on behalf of the Scottish Government and that shift of focus is reflected in the Government's motion today. The motion describes helping those made redundant gain other employment or opportunities as the core function of PACE rather than as one of a number of equally important tasks as was the case in its original remit. But of course getting unemployed people in those circumstances into jobs is rightly a very high priority and one on which the National Skill, Skills Agency should indeed uh, provide a lead. But the original vision which inspired the creation of PACE was also to prevent those redundancies from happening in the first place. Prevention is better than cure and indeed this government has said that they are in favour of preventive spend rather than simply picking up the pieces. So the ambition of government must be about continuing employment for whole sectors and workforces and not only about enabling individuals to find alternative jobs, uh, highly important though that is. All of the agencies and organisations involved in PACE are doing their best to help, but we believe the government itself needs to look at the bigger picture. The government or the enterprise agencies on its behalf should assess the effectiveness of early intervention to prevent redundancies to see if the change of focus over the last five years has reduced the ability of public agencies to prevent a redundancy situation from arising in the first place. Minister. I agree with, with the need, but can I uh, assure Mr MacDonald that the enterprise network is absolutely persuaded of the need to take early intervention and devote a considerable amount of time and effort of their officers, account managers and leaders 
to that end, a whole cross, a range of activity, including the coordinated support mechanism, the Early Intervention Network. Louis Sweet, I don't, I don't doubt that the will is there and the good intention is there. The question is how far it is able to deliver that, given the strength of focus uh, on post our redundancy situation. So, for example, what is taking the place of the local enterprise companies in providing early warning or local intelligence of what is going on in the local economy? How far are local trade unions or indeed local employers engaged on a routine basis to share uh, their knowledge of risks or threats to local jobs? And we need to know whether the appetite or capacity to address risks that have not yet become threats has been significantly affected by moving pace from an enterprise focus to one of skills development. For all these reasons, and with new threats to jobs in the Scottish economy today, the Scottish Government should look again at the role and remit of PACE to see if it is fit for the whole purpose, rather than simply say that we need to do more of the same. The most serious new threat to jobs in Scotland is, of course, posed by the prospect of low oil prices over an extended period, possibly uh, as long, uh, in the view of some of those in the sector, as two or three years. Acre, solu Acre Solutions yesterday followed Chevron, Shell, BP, ConocoPhillips and Talisman Sinopec in announcing hundreds of further job losses in Aberdeen and across the UK. Christian Allard. Uh, thanks, the member, for taking an intervention. And I heard what he said early on about how to help uh, individual companies when they're in difficulties. I, I still kind of think that the Scottish, the Scottish government is getting the right way to go about it by helping sectors as opposed to helping individual companies. It's very, very important that we are not seen as using public fund to help failing companies, but we use public fund to help the sector. So in oil and gas, we agree and support the, the Scottish Government to have a change of taxation which will help the, the, the sector as opposed to individual companies. Well, sorry, John, sorry, uh, your time. In, in, in a sense, the point I'm making is that it is not simply about picking up the pieces when a company goes bust. It is about intervening to assist uh, sectors by using uh, early intelligence uh, and by making those types of intervention. And, uh, and, and as Mr Allard will know, uh, besides the headline figures of hundreds of jobs at major oil companies, many other jobs have gone quietly at many of the smaller companies in the sector. Uh, but we need to have an assessment of the impact on the wider economy of those job losses before we can make a s sensible estimate of how many thousands of jobs have already gone and how many more are at risk. And, and my question then is, in this debate, how far pace has contributed to anticipating or mitigating the loss of jobs in the oil sector in the North East and beyond. And certainly the Scottish Government for a long time seemed to underestimate the impact of the falling price of oil on the Scottish economy and to regard it as merely cyclical or a blip rather than a serious threat to future production and employment. So, for example, we welcome, of course, the offer to protect oil industry apprenticeships, but it's worth noting that all the companies which have announced major redundancies so far have gone out of their way to avoid uh, including apprentices among those losing their jobs. And we welcome the establishment of a task group. What's critical is that it comes forward with serious proposals very quickly indeed. And Labour's amendment today promotes one such proposal, as the Minister has acknowledged, and that is a proposal to establish a resilience fund uh, as part of the next Scottish budget. Just as our local council, faced with an environmental shock like major flooding, can apply for extra funding under the Belwyn scheme, so a local council, faced with a sudden and unforeseen economic shock, could apply to the Scottish Government for support from such a resilience fund. They could then use that funding to make a real contribution to local economic resilience, for example, by providing short-term rates relief to help supply chain companies survive an initial economic shock. And a budget of £10 million, it seems to us, would be enough to get such a fund underway and to make a difference uh, in areas affected, for example, by the current position in the oil industry. But the Resilience Fund would not be specific to any one region or any one sector. It would be part of a renewed pace, an additional tool for partner agencies to use to anticipate and, where possible, to prevent job losses in the local area. And if ministers were to take this proposal on board through the budget process, we would, of course, work with them to set the right criteria and conditions to give real added value um, from such an additional fund. I'm happy to take an intervention. Adam Ingram. I thank the member uh, for taking my intervention. Could I ask Mr Macdonald why Labour have come to this so late in the day? 
Uh, you might recall that two years ago, uh, the coal industry suffered a major crisis with its, uh, two of its main companies going bust. Why no resilience fund for the coalfield communities that I represent? Lewis May Johnson, could you begin to conclude? Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, Mr Ingram is absolutely right. It's a very good example. The coal fields, particularly in East Ayrshire, are a very good example of exactly uh, why that should happen. And if Mr Ingram is chiding me for not coming to this sooner, I hope he will chide his front bench as well and ensure that ministers now get behind this proposal and make sure that what wasn't done two years ago is done now and can make a difference. We will continue, of course, as well to support partnership action for continuing employment, not just after redundancy, but to seek to prevent redundancy in line with the original remit and purpose of PACE when it was set up 15 years ago. And I hope we can work with members of other parties to ensure every mechanism is in place that can help us to do that. And to that end, I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call in Mardo Fraser. Six minutes or so, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome this afternoon's debate on the partner, Partnership Action for Continuing Employment. We have become used to hearing these terms when a redundancy is announced, and it is good to have this opportunity to, to uh, debate in more detail the work of PACE and how it functions and indeed how it might be improved. The first thing to say, of course, is that with the overall economic picture improving, we would hope that the requirement for PACE intervention will be diminishing. Since 2010, employment in Scotland is up by 175,000. Unemployment is down by 61,000. And although there was uh, a slight increase in the figures for the latest quarter, our unemployment rate is still lower than the rest of the United Kingdom. We have seen since 2010 some 265,000 new private sector jobs created in Scotland. All this is, of course, a testament to the economic stewardship of the UK coalition government, delivering the fastest growing economy in Europe yeah. and pursuing uh, a policy which was opposed at every turn by members on both the SNP and Labour benches in the Chamber today. But even against that successful backdrop, the reality is that we have a dynamic market economy where we will continue to see business successes and business failures. And even at a time of overall economic success and overall economic growth, there will be sectors which from time to time are hit with a downturn, just as we are seeing today in the oil and gas sector. And in that very sector, we have seen over the past few weeks a number of redundancies announced, which the Minister will be familiar with, and uh, I suspect and, and, and I fear uh, others may come uh, in uh, uh, the months uh, to come. Yes, of course, I'll give way. Minister. Um, can I ask if, if Murdo Fraser would agree with me that the main element that the oil and gas industry require at the moment from government is from the UK government and urgent action to introduce the tax reductions that are needed to send a strong message, as Sir Ian Wood has said, throughout the world and to prevent irreversible damage being sustained. And would Murdo Fraser, in a spirit of consensus, agree that the headline rate should be cut by at least 10 per cent and investment allowance and expiration measures, substantial measures, must be introduced uh, as soon as possible? Murdo Fraser. Well, the Minister and I have discussed these very points on a number of occasions over the past uh, few weeks. He knows perfectly well what our position is and that we do support uh, tax reductions to assist uh, the North Sea oil industry. And that point has been made by Ruth Davidson to the Chancellor of the Exchequer on a number uh, of occasions. But seeing as he mentions Sir Ian Wood, it's worth reflecting on the fact that Sir Ian himself has said that tax changes would make no difference now to the North Sea oil industry, nor prevent redundancies. In fact, they would not have any impact for the next six to nine months. So while I agree there is a requirement for the Westminster government to take action, let us not pretend that's going to have any impact in the short term, and that should not absolve the Scottish government, who has responsibility for economic development, for taking action themselves to deal with the situation in the North Sea at the moment. No, I, if the member will forgive me, I, I don't wish to, to be diverted into a debate about the oil and gas industry, which I'm sure we've had opportunity to debate in the past and will have uh, in the future. I want to move on uh, and get back to talking about PACE, which is what this debate is about, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, so where we have uh, business failures, it is important that the individuals affected get the support uh, they need to help access benefits, help find new work, help with retraining and make the transition into new employment that much easier. Now, the experience involved 
uh, experience of individuals involved with PACE teams has generally been positive. The Minister uh, referred to the report commissioned by Skills Development Scotland, which looked at the client experiences uh, of PACE, and that found that three quarters of those involved were overall satisfied with their interactions with PACE, although older clients, that's over 55, tended to be less satisfied than those in other age groups. Two thirds of users suggested PACE met or exceeded their expectations. The most useful component of the PACE scheme, according to this survey, was to help with job app applications and CVs. Now, the good news was that nearly three quarters of clients had found work following PACE's intervention, although unfortunately over half were being paid less than they had been in their previous position. Around a quarter had undertaken further education or training. So the conclusion overall is that PACE are providing a valuable service, generally well regarded. Nevertheless, I appreciate there remain ongoing concerns. I was very interested in what the Minister had to say about uh, PACE's involvement with very small employers. I think there's a general uh, view, uh, clearly incorrect, that uh, it's only there to help uh, with large-scale redundancies. But I wonder, and perhaps the Minister could deal with this when he's responding to the debate, whether more could be done in working with the business organisations, like the Chambers of Commerce and the Federation of Small Business, for example, to make sure they're aware of the availability of uh, uh, PACE for their members um, and they're spreading that uh, uh, message to them. Now, I read with interest the Labour amendment to the government's motion today. And I have sympathy with the call from Lewis MacDonald that the work of PACE should be reviewed in order to identify whether more proactive interventions can be made at an earlier stage, although I did note, to, note the Minister's uh, view that this is already happening uh, behind uh, the uh, scenes. And I listened with interest to Mr MacDonald's speech to see if he bring forward many examples of where there had been a failure to intervene. And I, I didn't hear many, but maybe uh, his Labour colleagues could, in the course of the debate, expand on that particular point. I was somewhat less convinced at Labour's call for the establishment of a resilience fund. If such a fund is to be established, I think we need to know exactly what it will be for. In what circumstances would it be called upon? What will be the criteria required for payments? On what basis has a budget of £10 million per annum been calculated? What exactly will that money be spent on? It rather sounds like a headline looking for a story to be written in order to justify it. So if Labour are going to attract us to support their amendment, I'm afraid they will need to provide a little bit more detail on these aspects. But with that caveat aside, Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope this will be largely a consensual debate. The Scottish Government told us in the middle of last year that there had been some 63,500 people had received support from PACE which reflects the number of large-scale redundancies that had occurred in the economy. But as I said earlier, I hope that with the general economic recovery, that figure will be declining, with the exception of problems, for example, in oil and gas. And it will mean we will unfortunately have a requirement for PACE for many years to come. Can I just, in closing, take the opportunity to uh, concur with the Minister in paying tribute to those who work for PACE? Their efforts are clearly valuable, and the evidence would suggest they are well regarded by their clients, and I hope that we can all agree that they deserve praise for their endeavours. And I am pleased to support the Government's motion. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now turn to the open debate speeches of six minutes. Please have a little bit of time in hand for interventions. Mark MacDonald to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Uh, th thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I've been reflecting on this for, for a few days in terms of what I was going to say in my remarks, and I've been struck by the fact that, to me, PACE partnerships are, are, are somewhat paradoxical in the sense that they do very good work in communities, but you kind of hope you'll never need to see them do it, because the upshot of them doing that work is that there are jobs at risk and redundancies uh, in, the, uh, in train. That, that said, um, PACE have been uh, active in the North East on a number of occasions uh, in recent years. That's despite the fact that the North East has been largely an area of economic buoyancy, uh, in particular uh, the only area of the UK which actually grew its economy during the period of the recession. Um, but that said, there have still been instances within the North East uh, of company insolvency and of redundancy. I recall in 2012 raising the issues around the, uh, the potential redundancy that Hall and Taws joinery in my constituency uh, with the Minister uh, at the time. And then during the Donside by-election the following year, spoke to a number of employees who had gone through that process and had had interactions with the PACE team uh, who spoke very positively uh, of the work which the, the PACE partnership had carried out during that period, which obviously 
was a cause of great uncertainty for many employees and their families. Now, I hear what Lewis MacDonald is saying around the issues around early intervention, and I think uh, it, it ties into some of what I was saying in terms of not wanting to see PACE uh, doing the work they're doing because of, of the implications. It, the implication would be that uh, much of the early intervention work is work that we really shouldn't hear about because uh, if it were to become public knowledge that PACE were interacting at an early stage, that obviously uh, sets hairs racing around the possible uh, sustainability of companies, about the possible job security for employees, and that can affect uh, potential future contract awards, things like that, which can obviously then have a, a significant knock-on effect. So uh, while I understand the point that Lewis MacDonald is making. I think that the, the Minister has given us some comfort in terms of the, the, the early intervention work he has outlined does take place. I think it would be better that we work on the basis that we don't want to see too much evidence uh, of early intervention taking place lest it, it put companies uh, in an awkward spot. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll take a brief intervention from Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to Mark McDonald. I think he makes a very reasonable point, but um, would you not accept that there is a period between where a company, uh, or indeed a wider sector, is seen to be in fairly rude health, uh, and the point at which redundancies uh, are having to be made, where there probably is an opportunity for interventions to be made that can stave off uh, redundancies, but in a sense don't reveal anything that the, the market um, and, and those employees aren't well aware of uh, already. Mark McDonald. I, I, I take the point Liam MacArthur makes. I simply say that uh, if, if word were to get out that a company were involved with a PACE partnership, because of the, um, the, the, the connotations that the PACE partnership has around dealing with redundancy, uh, redundancies, that has potential for, for a knock-on impact. That, that was merely the point I was making. But it doesn't deflect from the fact that there should be early interventions where possible, and the Minister has highlighted that does happen. I just think that we, we need to have faith in the fact that, that, that those will take place and we won't be reading about that early intervention taking place. And again, if there are examples of where that early intervention hasn't happened, I think we need to hear about them. It certainly hasn't been my experience of any of the, the situations that companies in my constituency have gone through where PACE have been involved, that they've had any complaint around the, the speed and the efficacy uh, of, of the work of the PACE partnership. I think there are opportunities as well uh, to, to be explored um, in, in relation to the ongoing situation at present in, in the North East that, that perhaps could be foc the focus of some of the work uh, of organisations involved in the PACE partnership. For example, at a recent briefing at North East Scotland College, one of the points that was highlighted to uh, members was the difficulty the college is having in attracting appropriate uh, individuals to lecture in some of the oil and gas courses uh, at the college. Uh, it strikes me that um, one of the upshots of some of the work that is uh, taking place in the North East might be to identify identify potentially individuals from the redundancy rounds that are taking place who could potentially be directed towards the college or vice versa uh, as potentially being able to fill some of that skills gap. Um, I turn again to the, the issue around the, the resilience fund and, and want to maybe explore this in the sort of last part of my speech. Um, I think Murdo Fraser actually makes a very strong point in that what we've seen initially was an announcement of a, res of, of a resilience fund being called for. And ever since then, we've kind of had various stages of detail being applied to it. And I get the, I get the feeling that another couple of weeks, we might finally have a crystallization of exactly what that resilience fund would do. It now appears uh, that that is £10 million which local authorities can use to provide rates relief uh, in, their, in their areas. I would question exactly how that, uh, Im what, what impact that would have in areas, for example, uh, in relation to some of the large multinational companies in the northeast of Scotland at present. If we're talking about supply chain companies, as we know at the moment, uh, much of the focus of, 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 of cost-cutting that is taking place within the oil and gas sector at the moment is focused heavily on contracted staff uh, and, and also staff working within the organisation itself. It hasn't started to leach into the supply chain uh, at present. So uh, in terms of the Resilience Fund, I, I, I think there needs to be a little bit more detail uh, in terms of what the impact of that would be. And I appreciate it's not just about the oil and gas sector. And I think Lewis MacDonald was a, a little bit unfair to my colleague Adam Ingram and perhaps uh, misinterpreted, perhaps willfully misinterpreted what Adam Ingram was saying. I don't think Adam Ingram was saying you should have called for this previously. I think his question was, why it was that Labour hadn't called for it previously if it was such a good idea. And I think the Minister has outlined 
the employability fund, the £52 million employability fund, and also the £150 million worth of structural funds that are available uh, to provide very much the kind of economic support for communities and for regions that, that Lewis McDonald has highlighted. I know I'm at 6.20. I, I see Mr McDonald is offering me an intervention. The presiding officer, well, if, if it's if it's if It would have to be very brief. Well, that, that's in the gift of Mr McDonald. Lewis I'll give McDonald way to him on the basis please. it will be. I'm very grateful. Does Mark McDonald accept that? The, the detail of, of such a fund is one thing. The principle of enabling local councils to apply for support in order to pr uh, help supply chain companies is another and something that government could Mark work McDonald's, with. and if you could come well, to I a think, conclusion. I think, we, I think we had this little exchange last week, and you know, the devil is always in the detail of these things and how it would be applied and how e effective it would be. I think there is a large amount of Scottish government money uh, and also EU money which is available to Scotland, which is doing a great deal of uh, good in communities already in supporting some of the employment objectives. Uh, finally, President Officer, all I would say is I welcome the Minister's remarks regarding the issue around scale of redundancy. While large-scale redundancies often grab the headlines, we shouldn't forget that small-scale redundancies have many individual stories contained within them, and the support that can be given to individuals and to companies in those circumstances is just as valuable to local economies across Scotland. Thank you very much. I now call Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Chick Brodie. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Like others in the Chamber, I represent a part of the country where there has been a recurrent need for PACE teams. Communities across Scotland are still reeling from the loss of jobs at CityLink when workers were told on Christmas that they would be out of work by New Year. The relocation of Rolls-Royce from East Kilbride to Inshinnan, while not directly leading to redundancies, is expected to, to affect the supply chain and significantly reduce the already declining manufacturing base in the town. But it was the closure of the Jays manufacturing plant in East Kilbride that prompted me to really investigate PACE and look at the effectiveness of the scheme in detail. Jays are one of the country's leading manufacturers of cleaning products and fluids. Over a period of 130 years, Jays has grown from humble beginnings to become a manufacturer with global reach. Retailers in over 60 different countries worldwide have Jays products on their shelves, and many of us will have some of those products in our own kitchens and bathrooms. East Kilbride shared in the success of the firm, having been home to the manufacturer for over 40 years. Yet, in 2012, Jays decided to consolidate manufacturing at Thetford in Norfolk and close East Kilbride plant, despite a strong counter-proposal from local management, South Lancashire Council and the Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service. This was a profitable plant. The workers were not just productive and committed, but most of them were highly skilled and many had been working at Jays for over 15 years. The loss of these jobs was a body blow for the workforce and the manufacturing industry. Workers there told me that the whole experience was most daunting for those who had been with the firm for years, but not long enough to consider retirement. PACE teams were deployed. They provided assistance with CV preparation interview skills, benefits advice, the practical support we know is most valued when workers are being made redundant. I brought the factory workers facing redundancy to my own jobs fair in East Kilbride and secured extra support from Skills Development Scotland at that event to reinforce those job seeking skills. I also met with the PACE team to hear in detail about how they approach workplaces like Jay's. And the lessons I took away from that experience are broadly reflected in the client experience survey, as previously mentioned. Help with CVs and applications is overwhelmingly appreciated. Information about training and funding for training continues to rank among the most popular of PACE services. The initial presentation to workers could be delivered earlier, especially when a, a workforce is forewarned about an employer's intention to make staff redundant. Yet two thirds of those surveyed had to take a pay cut in their first job after the PACE intervention and half continued in lower paying work. And that's the last point, is the one that I want to stress. PACE is our way of supporting workers who face redundancy back into the labour market. But the labour market is changing. And to give workers the best chance of securing continuing and meaningful employment, we need to influence those changes. We need a strategy which insulates Scotland against economic shocks such as those we are seeing in the North Sea in oil and gas, which reverses the decline of our manufacturing base in places like East Kilbride. 
I believe in a strong, resilient, higher wage, better skill economy in which growth is more evenly distributed, then, then we must ensure that we do not simply replace the good quality, secure work we lose with less well-paying, less secure work. Indeed, our aim should be to retain those jobs that contribute most to the economy and prevent painful and wasted redundancies in the first place. Presiding officer, I believe that pay services can be delivered sooner. I believe we must do more than respond to redundancy. Where we can, we must prevent it. And as discussed previously, I believe there is a strong and compelling case for an economic resilience fund. And for those reasons, I will support the Labour Amendment. However, I would say to all members that we cannot separate the issue of how we support people facing redundancy with how we reshape and rebalance the economy as a whole. We must ask ourselves, for the sake of those faced with redundancy and those struggling with unemployment, whether the economy we have is really the economy we want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chick Brody to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, <coughs> Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the debate today and, and uh, will support the motion. As a young manager with NCR Manufacturing Dundee some years ago, I had the privilege of working with a company, a, a team of individuals that the company saw its workforce increase from 1,100 to 6,500 on the back of demands for decimalization and the simultaneous creation of a new computer range. Sadly, because of changing technology, the uh, demands eventually meant that the numbers fell back uh, over six years to 1,500. This over the course of seven redundancies, the consequences of which still live with me today to sit opposite good colleagues, wives, mothers, husbands, fathers and others, and advise them that their job was redundant not once, not twice, but seven times, still hurts to this day. And that's why in every election uh, since I have made job creation and continued employment to be a, my major uh, driver. Pace didn't exist then, but happily it does uh, today. The drawing together of local and uh, national bodies like SDS, Job Centre Plus, and the local authorities, among others like the STUC and affiliated unions, as I say, nowadays provides a rapid response to a redundancy. Deputy Presiding Officer, change is a constant, and redundancy has become a consequence, hopefully a very uh, limited one, of that change, be it economic, competitive, or financial. And how we address it, and how we address it speedily, is absolutely critical. Our first objective, of course, has to be that the risk of redundancy is minimised. That's determined by a very focused economic strategy underpinned by a business support infrastructure that embraces our enterprise agencies, by the security of capital investment, invested £11 billion over the last four years, by the creation of opportunities for young people and of modern apprenticeships, and by the creation of uh, things such as the Youth Employment Fund. However, as I say, change is constant, and the strengths of our economy, our small business sector, our exports, our foreign direct investment will not buttress us wholly uh, against the business circumstances ending in compulsory redundancies uh, uh, that I uh, mentioned before. However, <coughs> a rapid response task force in the nature of the PACE partnerships, 18 of them in, in Scotland, was and is the appropriate vehicle to mitigate the challenge of, of those uh, redundancies. Without it, we should then ask how would the 63,500 individuals across Scotland made redundant over the last five and a half years have responded to that situation on their own? Imagine the landscape of uh, Vian and halls of Broxburn. The impact has been mentioned of the serious consequence of the open cast coal mines in, in East Ayrshire and elsewhere. And now, albeit I believe a short term consequence of the oil and gas sector, among others, what uh, would people have done without the support of the PACE uh, organisation and structure? These and other redundancy challenges demanded the construction of that government led initiative, and so it proved to be. Uh, successful. 
So it's happened. If I pay a particular credit to any part of the organisation, a Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to uh, give credit to the STUC and the union's role in these initiatives. It, and I do so because of my experience uh, of that that I mentioned when I was with NCR, when at that time, when there was no such partnership, the unions did what they felt they had to do in uh, protection jobs. So pace is an important ingredient in getting people back into work and not least uh, our young people. But I suggest our horizons should not be limited. In an increasingly confident economy, we need new entrepreneurs, new businesses. And I personally would like to see PACE's even greater emphasis, and they have a great emphasis on, on, on training and, and bringing people back in work, but a greater emphasis on the creation of new small businesses through facilitated investment and meaningful business mentoring. For example, how many embryonic engineering, engineering services, export supply companies could there be uh, uh, from those currently facing uh, redundancy? Our international network and competitiveness might secure more rapid jobs and employment growth through the creative of such productive small businesses and or social enterprise in anticipation of whatever sector they're in, anticipation of the sector's recovery. Notwithstanding the basis and the need for PACE's creation, it is a success in achieving what it set out to do and more power uh, to its elbow. I beg to support. Thank you very much. And I now call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Adam Ingram. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, with the figures this week on exports and, and growth, all the indications are our economy is continuing to emerge from the depths of the difficulties faced uh, not in the not-so-distant past. Unemployment, unemployment, business confidence and a range of other measures, we are seeing relatively strong growth as the economy here in Scotland and across the UK continues to recover, thanks in no small way to the tough decisions being taken by the Coalition Government. Even average wages are now starting to show signs of improvement, which is particularly welcome. Nevertheless, no one would reasonably argue that we are out of the woods yet, and circumstances in a range of sectors remain very challenging indeed. Uh, that is borne out by a series of disappointing uh, announcements by a range of individual companies over recent months, notably, though not exclusively, in the oil and gas sector. And in that respect, I think the Scottish Government is very much to be congratulated on the timing uh, of this debate. Whether or not the debate this afternoon proves to be useful will perhaps depend rather on the willingness of the Minister to reflect on uh, some of what I think have been constructive contributions this afternoon and make changes where they are seen to be necessary. I'm bound to say the wording of the motion was not initially uh, encouraging in this respect, melding together a quite legitimate uh, element of self-congratulations about p uh, PACE, but an absence uh, of any recognition that improvements might need to be made. Though I think, to be fair, the Minister did correct some uh, of that uh, in his opening uh, remarks. I, I would fairly acknowledge and put on record um, the, uh, the, the contribution that PACE makes uh, and its strengths. I think uh, Mr Ewing's motion quite rightly points to the collaborative approach, which is a genuine strength and absolutely integral to making these interventions work. Of course, this involves not simply collaboration across the public, private and third sector, including the trade unions that a number of colleagues have mentioned, which the motion specifically refers to, but also joint working within the public sector. Given the constitutional setup that exists now, and even in a post-Smith Commission uh, context, there is an imperative for both Scotland's governments to work closely and constructively together. Turf battles do nothing to help those that pace is there to serve. It was therefore a little disappointing that the First Minister initially chose not to specifically include UK departments and agencies such as DEC and DWT, DWP in the task force set up in response to the current challenges facing the oil and gas sector. That said, I welcome the apparent change of heart there uh, has been on this following the uh, representations my colleague Willie Rennie made at First Minister's questions earlier this month. The establishment of that task force is nevertheless very welcome, as indeed is the decision to guarantee apprenticeships across the oil and gas sector. Uh, but while it would be unfair, I think, to draw comparisons between that sector and others in our economy, I do wonder whether the commitments given in this instance uh, will now be expected to be matched elsewhere in future, and perhaps that's something the Minister can come back to in closing. 
Mr Ewing is, in, is also entitled to point to the statistics on those who have been helped into employment and other opportunities as a, a result of PACE support. Nevertheless, this does rather gloss over some of the shortcomings that have been highlighted, but at least some of those who have experience of PACE. Whether or not uh, those, are in a minority, uh, those, those are minority views, uh, I think they do represent valid and indeed valuable feedback uh, on which we should um, take note and, and, and take action, as well as over half of those confirming uh, that they've moved into employment where salary levels are lower than those they had previously. Concerns have been raised about the lack of personalised support. There is, for example, a reduction, albeit slight, in the number of people rating the pay support as relevant and useful. And as this is often a signpost to other services, it is, I think, perhaps a concern that more of those who rely on it may find it less effective at meeting their needs than was the case previously. These findings are not wholly surprising to me as they reflect some of the feedback I've had in recent time from constituents who have been on the receiving end, as well as complaints about a lack of early contact post-redundancy. Offers of help with sprucing up a CV were seen as, quote, inadequate in the circumstances. It will certainly be interesting to see what feedback there is overall from those in, for example, the wave energy sector who have found themselves in need of PACE support uh, in recent times. In passing, Two months on since Palamas went into administration, it appears the problems facing this sector are not deemed sufficiently important to merit a debate in this parliament, a situation I find, frankly, inexcusable. One of the other areas flagged up by the recent... I uh, certainly will. Yes, of course. Minister. Um, I mean, as Mr MacArthur knows, we've, we've had a private meeting and I'm very happy to have a further briefing session with him. And can I assure him that uh, the future of wave energy in Scotland of the, the whole sector is something that HIE, I know, are working on very hard indeed, and I'm very happy to, uh, uh, to confirm that that is receiving a great deal of my attention, that of Alex Patterson of HIE, and is, an, is very much a priority for the Scottish Government. Liam McCarthy. I, I thank the Minister not just for that intervention, but uh, as he says, for the uh, time that he's uh, committed to those uh, discussions with myself and indeed Alex Patterson, but I do think it is remiss of this Parliament not to have had an opportunity to debate the wider issues, notwithstanding the fact that I think there have been commercial sensitivities around some of the discussions in relation uh, to Palamas and the establishment of Wave Energy Scotland. One of the other areas flagged up in recent feedback reports on PACE as requiring attention is the need for more, a, a more timely point of intervention. Uh, those in the wave energy sector would perhaps agree with this assessment, which in essence I think speaks to the points in Lewis MacDonald's uh, amendment. Uh, I note Mr Ewing's uh, reassurances uh, on, uh, on this, and I would observe that it's perhaps not good enough for PACE to be seen as something for ministers to refer to when asked by MSPs what they are doing in response to a major uh, set of job losses in a particular constituency or region. Uh, originally, part of the pro purpose of PACE was to identify where key companies or sectors were experiencing difficulties and intervene in order to mitigate difficulties, reducing any job losses and ensuring that those made redundant were helped into new employment. That is not always possible, of course, but we absolutely must guard against uh, PACE coming to be seen as a response after the fact, rather than something that is activated much earlier in the process. Indeed, I have even seen ministerial responses that refer to the fact that PACE stands ready to provide whatever support is needed, which does rather suggest a level of reactivity that does not altogether inspire confidence. Deputy Presiding Officer, the final aspect of this issue I wanted to reflect on before concluding is the role of colleges in helping deliver pathways back into employment. While in some instances former employees can be taken on by competitor companies in similar roles and on similar terms, generally speaking some degree of retraining and reskilling is inevitable. Colleges are crucial to this and therefore the cuts we have seen to college budgets over the last two to three years is a real concern. Everyone knows that these cuts have come at a dis disproportionate effect uh, on older learners. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is right uh, and very welcome the Scottish Government gives Parliament an opportunity to debate the work undertaken by PACE uh, and to consider its strengths and also uh, its weaknesses. The collaborative approach is absolutely essential and those involved can feel justifiably proud of many of the interventions they have been able to I'm make. You must close. However, we owe it to them and to those PACEs there to serve to ensure that we acknowledge where things are not working as they should if, uh, effectively. Uh, otherwise, this well-motivated motion and debate and a very well, uh, valuable and generally well-regarded service will be seen as a missed opportunity. Many thanks. I call Adam Ingram to be followed by Drew Smith. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. As someone who has been made redundant twice in my working career, 
I can vouch for the authenticity of the introduction to the PACE Guide, which is issued to people facing that prospect, which states, redundancy can be one of the most challenging and stressful things you'll ever face, and you'll understandably feel daunted and unsure of what to do next. But thankfully, nowadays, PACE is there to help with all the support and advice needed to move on and move out of that crisis situation. As an Ayrshire MSP, I can also vouch for the effectiveness of the PACE response to the all too frequent calls on their services. Some of these involve very large scale job losses like uh, Johnny Walker's bottling plant, which was especially painful for my colleague Willie Coffey and his Kilmarnock constituency. However, the notice given and the long lead-in time allowed PACE advisors to reduce the final figure in terms of redundancy to just over 10% of those initially expected to be seeking work. More difficult issues have arisen when companies have either willfully failed to engage in the PACE process or entered suddenly into administration. And I want to highlight two particular cases which illustrate problems needing to be addressed, but perhaps by, through better company regulation. The first relates to the collapse and liquidation of the two major companies operating in the open cast mining sector, Scottish Coal and ATH, with neither employer being willing to engage with PACE at the appropriate time. This inevitably, inevitably resulted in over 700 workers nationwide and 311 in East Ayrshire alone, being left with neither work nor any immediate sense of support from the public sector. Now, to his great credit, the Minister acted swiftly, setting up the Coal Industry Task Force to rescue the industry's viability, whilst East Ayrshire Council set up a local response team which significantly enhanced the public sector response. And the effectiveness of the PACE partners' response is best illustrated by a survey of those made redundant a year after the event, showing only 13% of the workforce still unemployed and looking for a job. And that's despite the fact that Scottish Coal had failed to train and certificate levels of competence in its workforce which would allow employees to secure equivalent jobs out with the company. The second and truly scandalous case I want to refer to is that of US Seed and Donald in my constituency, which I raised at FMQs a little over two weeks ago. This establishment, part of the Sports Direct group of company, was owned by billionaire Mike Ashley, and the UK's biggest sporting goods retailer was summarily closed without warning or notice to its workforce on the 7th of January. Even before employees knew it was happening, a fleet of sports direct trucks had, had arrived at the warehouse to remove its stock. So there was no chance there, Mr. MacDonald, for early intervention. This blatant breach of statutory duty was further compounded by a management refusal to allow PACE access to the site. And despite repeated attempts by the Scottish Government and the Minister himself, Sports Direct ignored offers of help for USC workers and access wasn't granted until administrators were on site a week later. Now, this is deplorable behaviour and shouldn't escape severe legal sanction, but it probably will, given the weakness of UK employment law. A loyal workforce of some 88 people have been treated with contempt by an extremely wealthy employer who appears content to wash his hands of any responsibility to pay redundancy or even wages due. This truly is the unacceptable face of capitalism and makes a mockery of our industrial relations system. As the Minister highlighted, the STUC is one of the PACE partners and I was pleased 
to attend a meeting organized by them for the USC workforce with Thompson solicitors who specialize in employment law. The aim of the meeting was to inform people of their rights under the law to seek some compensation for USC's failure to consult on the redundancy. And that's by way of protective awards through an employment tribunal. But even if successful, this process can take six months to a year to complete and clearly doesn't deal with the immediate financial crisis many of the redundant workers are facing. So this is one area of employment law which needs to be strengthened. And to my mind, there is an unanswerable case for the powers over employment law to be devolved to this parliament to bring about a much needed enhancement of workers' rights. Exploitative employers like Mike Ashley require to be held to account for their actions. Thank you. Many thanks. <clears throat> I now call Drew Smith to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Uh, thanks very much, President Officer. I think over the course of the afternoon, there's maybe been about two dozen offers in the Chamber, and I think we, we've all got a different experience, we've all got different skills, and of course we've got differences in political outlook. But we've got one thing in common um, this afternoon which separates us, I think, from any similarly sized gathering uh, of uh, the people that we represent, and that is that we're all well paid, um, we're all reasonably secure in our jobs, um, at least until election time, and the chances are that most of us enjoy or receive some degree of fulfilment from our work. And some of us uh, will have experienced unemployment in the past, um, uh, as Mr Ingram referred to, or like myself, some of us will have grown up uh, in families where there's been shorter or longer periods uh, of, of uh, one or two parents looking for work. But for the moment, as a representative gathering of uh, people in Scotland, we're unique in that none of us is unemployed, none of us is at risk of unemployment, none of us is suffering underemployment or enduring unfulfilling or even exploitative employment. And I just say that to put in context um, what I wanted to say in, in the rest of this debate, because I think it's all well and good um, to thank those involved in efforts to secure continuing employment uh, for others, and I absolutely do that. Um, but we should remember that lack of work is a deeply personal and debilitating thing, um, which can render an individual humiliated to the point of contributing towards mental illness. It can put stress on the family to the point of uh, family breakdown. Um, this, uh, quite simply, is a social evil, and it should be regarded as such. Uh, and not just a matter of policy where we view redundancies as an undesirable outcome to be minimised, a cost which must be uh, borne, um, uh, or worst of all, I, I think in my view, um, a tragedy that is somehow unavoidable uh, or unpredictable. Redundancy is not an act of God, um, although there are um, situations where the person making the decisions or the company making those, the, the decisions about redundancy does behave in that way. Um, and that is, the, that is the reality. They are certainly very clear about who is playing the role of deity in these situations. And PACE, is, as has been described by uh, Lewis MacDonald and Mark MacDonald, um, I would absolutely agree with and, and support. Um, but we need to do uh, much better than this. Redundancy is an outcome, um, in my view, which I think society has come to too readily accept uh, as just a normal part of the economic cy uh, cy uh, cycle. Uh, and I, I would accept that there are situations where uh, it is going to be the only option and that it is an option which uh, the employers involved will be, uh, will be pursued with genuine grief and after strenuous efforts to ensure it, it doesn't happen. Um, but in these circumstances, initiatives to uh, advise redundant workers of their best chance at being re-engaged are necessary, but they're still in most circumstances reactive. Um, and I do have to question why the lead partner for um, PACE is, is still Skills Development Scotland, which is a training body rather than Scottish Enterprise, which is the Jobs and Economic Development Agency. Um, encouraging workers to reskill um, for another job uh, other than the one for which they're already trained. Yes, it is, always, it is going to be uh, necessary in some situations, and that can be a positive thing. Uh, and some people may never look back uh, after that experience. But we need to face um, some other facts which follow from only pursuing that approach or for pursuing that approach um, first. And that is um, that some of these workers will not be reskilled at all. They will be, in effect, de-skilled because they will um, end up uh, well, they will discover that the, their period of unemployment or, or, or their instance of redundancy it doesn't lead to an opportunity for career development. Rather, it leads them um, 
uh, in, into a situation um, where they are subsequently underpaid uh, in their new occupation, um, where the qualifications or skills that are required in the, the new occupation are not compatible with the previous employment. We need to remember that the purpose of PACE, um, or one of the important purposes of PACE, is about ensuring continuity for the household, ensuring continuity for the family affected uh, by redundancy. That, you do not have continuity uh, if, yes, you have another job, but you are paid substantially less uh, than you were before. The impact uh, from that can be um, severe too. Um, or if you are uh, moved on into a job where uh, job security uh, remains low, and that could be the result of you know, various other things that we, that we talk about regularly um, in this place that are happening in our economy. Zero hours uh, contracts would be one, um, being asked to work without contracts, um, or where collect collective bargaining um, is non existent. And uh, I listen carefully to, to Mr. Ingram's point about uh, USC Dundonald, and, and I agree with him. But one of the reasons, of course, that, we, that STC and Thompson solicitors needed to step in in that case was because there was no collective bargaining. Um, in the facility, no recognition of the union and no, um, no uh, density of union membership, which means that people are unaware of their rights, uh, their employment rights at the, at the time of, of redundancy. And while I would agree that their, their employment rights should be improved, um, there also needs to be a greater understanding of the rights that people have uh, and respect for those rights um, by their employer. Because, I mean, I've said in this chamber before that the world of work consists of good employers and less good employers, just as uh, the workforce is made up of good workers and uh, not so conscientious workers. And the point is not to denigrate all for the sins of a minority, but it's to recognise that fundamentally the workplace and the necessity of selling our labour um, is, it has a fundamental potential for exploitation. And it is for that reason, not the individual circumstances of particular companies or others, that employment requires to be regulated. And there is no greater example of the potential for exploitation than the issue of redundancy. Because redundancy can be, and frankly it is used uh, on occasion, to provide a threat to ensure that workers comply uh, with uh, working practices that the employers uh, wish to promote. Um, it, it, uh, uh, generally, which lead to greater uh, uh, insecurity. I mentioned temporary contracts, those issues of bogus self-employment. There are plenty of examples. Um, and then just turning to the instances where the workplace as a whole uh, or a substantial part of the work uh, of a workplace is being declared as redundant, often we need to uh, recognise this. The work is not redundant at all. It's the workers who are redundant. The work is not being made, made redundant. The work has simply been moved uh, elsewhere, um, more than likely to uh, somewhere where um, uh, the com in the company's eyes it will be termed to be more competitive, um, which basically means where job security will be weakened, where pay will be weakened, or where safety uh, regulation will be, be grateful um, if you could begin uh, to conclude. weakened, uh, presiding officer. And I do think we need to um, therefore go back to first principles on the issue, issue of pace. We all accept there is good work uh, being done by Partnership Action for continuing um, employment, but it is a reactive service in the main. And I hear what the Minister and others have said about um, the wish to protect companies um, from uh, revealing information about uh, the their, their situation. But we do need to have a greater deal of confidence and expectation that companies do have an early engagement uh, with uh, the services to, so that we avoid redundancy rather than just simply mitigate it after it happens. And I therefore support the Labour Amendment. Many thanks. I now call Danish Robertson to be followed by Christian Allard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, <coughs> partnership action, continued employment. I think the partnership aspect is uh, very pertinent and um, we've got to look at how we use that partnership within the sort of local communities uh, where we live and the constituencies we represent. Uh, Murdo Fraser raised uh, an important uh, aspect uh, in his speech and that was the smaller um, uh, agencies, companies, etc. Probably the, the, the small and medium sized businesses. And Colin Borland uh, from FSB mentioned in the February 2014 at the PACE conference uh, this very area about the individual support that seemed to be lacking for this particular group. Uh, and my recall from that was that the, the, the minister, uh, Fergus Ewan, um, actually uh, responded very positively at that time. And, and the interesting thing about the, the conference presiding officer, it was... Um, if I recall, was the change of pace was the title. And they were looking at all aspects of pace and how it operates within the sector.
to try and enable this early intervention. Can I say I concur fully with Mark MacDonald in that it would be wrong to advertise the early intervention of PACE within a sector or organisation because then you undermine the confidence within that area. I think it's, it's OK when, when maybe redundancies have been announced and it hits the headlines to say that PACE is now involved. But my understanding is that PACE can and do get involved at an earlier stage. Because if we're looking at continued employment, sometimes we're actually looking at preventing the redundancy from happening in the first place. It's looking at alternative means to try and secure work uh, for the employee. Now, it'd be remiss of me, uh, presiding officer, if I didn't mention the energy sector, uh, because I represent uh, the uh, Aberdeenshire West constituency. And as the Minister knows, I often mention West Hill when I'm in the chamber uh, because it is the Europe's capital of the subsea sector uh, within the industry. <coughs> and can I say that I, I certainly welcome the appointment of Lena Wilson, who I think uh, with her uh, expertise and knowledge from Scottish Enterprise, will fulfil her role uh, remarkably well uh, in, in, in reporting back to the Minister uh, with the, uh, the discussions that she'll be having within the energy sector, specifically within oil and gas. And we've got to look at how we try and ensure, presiding officer, that we don't try and inject or install uh, a situation which really doesn't exist within the sector at the moment. Because if, if we try and present that there is a crisis within the sector, are young people coming through, are young people or graduates going to university, <coughs> those going on to college, looking for a future within oil and gas, maybe looking at alternatives, looking at alternatives for their education, looking at alternatives for their training. And that is something we cannot afford. We have, we have a problem already within a skill shortage within the industry. And it's well recognised that, that that skill shortage exists. And if we, continue to, if we continue to highlight that there's a problem within the sector, it, it's, only, it's only right that our young people may be looking at alternatives. So I would actually suggest to the sector uh, that we try and, and ensure that there's still a very positive message out there. There is a future within the energy sector. And we need to try and get that balance right because we, we, we've got to ensure that those coming through the college sector have a, a, a prospect of employment and those coming through the university sector, the graduates, also have an opportunity uh, before them. We cannot and we do not control the oil price, but we can, we can control what we, what we, the message we portray to our young workforce. And I think this is where the, the partnership again is very important and it is important that our young people have the appropriate skills and this is where SDS I think does provide uh, a great opportunity to probably upskill maybe some of our, our, our younger people or maybe some of those that have been made redundant already giving them the opportunity not to de-skill but to upskill to give them new skills to, to make them more employable within the sector because the sector will need them presiding officer. What can be done at the moment? Well, I think what can be done, and, uh, and I take on uh, Mordo Fraser's comments about Sir Ian Wood, but can I say to Mordo Fraser that I actually believe I've heard on more than one occasion, and I believe it is still the case, that the oil and gas sector are seeking stability within their, their taxation. So they are looking for a reversal the tax hike that happened in 2011. They are looking for uh, incentives to uh, look at the exploration of, of uh, difficult areas uh, within the North Sea. So I would actually say that something can be done now. I would sincerely hope that uh, the, the Labour Party would actually uh, move with the Scottish Government in trying to ensure that the George Osborne, the Chancellor of the Stecker, makes an early announcement to assist the sector, to have that stability and the confidence to move forward. And then it will certainly make the, the job of PACE much easier 
when they're actually talking to people within the North East, especially at the moment with the, the current situation of a prospect of a bright future. So, presiding officer, let's, let's welcome the work that PACE does and let's welcome the opportunities that are still there within the sector because that is the future. Thank you, presiding officer. Many thanks. I now call Christian Allard to be followed by Paul Martin. Thank you very much, presiding officer, and I'm delighted to follow uh, Dennis Robertson's comments, uh, which I agree uh, wholeheartedly with, uh, because, of course, what's important is to make sure to understand where we are at. And where we are at, Scotland's economy continues to grow, and our unemployment rate is the lowest in the UK. So we have to understand this. We have to be very careful when we talk about job losses, is uh, which situation we are. There are a lot of jobs available uh, uh, across the sector, uh, presenting officer. But all their successes as a result of a government understanding businesses and using the economic levers at its disposal. And I wish we would have more of these economic levers, uh, for example, like employment law, like uh, uh, the... Uh, as my colleague said uh, before me. Uh, regarding the present situation, which was talked about in the energy sector, half of the oil and gas operators have already reported a reduction in contractor staff, with almost two-thirds expecting further reduction in contractors this year. And that came from a survey of uh, as a Chamber of Commerce of, uh, of Aberdeen and Grampian. And we were at a meeting again last week with Dennis Robertson and others, uh, and where we were told that a lot of these uh, jobs, of course, uh, job losses were in fact uh, already uh, planned. Uh, they were planned following the, uh, the Sir Ian Wood recommendation to streamline the industry. So we have to understand about the context of these job losses. Uh, they are not all due uh, to the to the to the old, uh, old prices. And but further uh, job losses could be could be due to that. But uh, again repeating uh, my colleague Dennis Robertson, there is an easy answer to this, and it's not an early answer from the Chancellor, because uh, it's, it's a bit late. Uh, when, when in 2011 the, the present government decided to, uh, to, to uh, put a hike on taxation to, to, to the sector, uh, we, we should have reverted straight away. We should have not waited 2012, 2013, or 2014, we should, or 2015. We should have done it straight away. And it's a way to do it. It's a way to do it, Mr. McDonald, and if you give me a minute, because we need to help certain sectors from the, from, from the upstream, not when it's too late. And that's very important. Not wait that the job has lost, but making sure, as a role of a government, is to make sure we, we give the conditions, and pay, particularly the tax, on taxation, the condition for uh, companies to grow and prosper. Lewis MacDonald. I'm very grateful to Mr Allard for giving way. I, in a sense, he's made my point, though. If indeed many of the job losses which are affecting people and causing redundancies in the North Sea sector were predictable, as he suggests, is that not all the more reason why PACE and government agencies should have been in early uh, in order to work with companies and with those facing redundancy in order to reduce the economic impact? Christian it should have been done earlier. It should have been done in 2011. Like, like, like I just said, it's taxation. It's where uh, the, the, the government can do it. You know, any uh, resident fund is too late. You know, it's not what should be done. And I go back to uh, Mr Ingram again, con contribution. We have to be very careful that if a, 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 a Labour government at one point decide to have such a, su su such a fund, but it's not given to the wrong people because it might be given re to the employers which deserve it the least as opposed to helping upstream uh, 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 best, best companies uh, when it's needed uh, at, at, uh, at, at the taxation level. But it's very important to understand as well that other sectors, and people talked about other sectors, other sectors have uh, the same kind of problem. We've got a problem of skill shortage because we've got a great problem of skill shortages, not only in Scotland, but across the UK. So we, we maybe have from time to time a, 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 a problem of, of, of people losing their jobs, but some, some, uh, some of my colleagues talked about it earlier. Uh, the most important and the key, key thing is to uh, making sure we can upskill uh, uh, best workers, not only during the, the, the time of work, but when we are losing their employment. And for example, uh, we'll see the, uh, the, the growth on house building activity that we have uh, noticed uh, recently. Uh, Scotland construction sector is expanding uh, steadily over the next five years and with thousands of new trade 
trade people are required to replace those retiring. Uh, we are an aging population. A lot of people are going to retire in the next few years. So it's not only uh, there's jobs, but there are plenty of jobs available who are going to happen. So uh, it's very important that uh, uh, PACE recognize it. And of course, with SDS, we are very uh, equipped to do this, to work on the skills and making sure that people have the proper skills to respond to the sectors that, that need this, this employees. And we, talked, we can talk about, of course, uh, in rural Scotland, we can talk about the farmers. The farmers are getting older and older. The, the average for farmers is around about uh, 60 years old, and a large proportion of those uh, have no success in place. So it's very important that the government does this, and it does this with the Scottish uh, Rural Development Programme. Uh, we have, as well, in the uh, fishing industry, which is important, Abinshai Council is launching next month a fishery project pending the development of modern apprenticeship in maritime occupations and AMA. But what is important is not only for our young people, but as Mr. Robertson said, it's uh, very important for people who change career because this loss of job, let's understand it, we're not, we are in the 21st century uh, where people are not going to keep a job for life. So they need the skills to make sure that they can progress in, in different careers during their life. We, all of us, I had, most of us had, a, had other jobs before. I, myself, I had at least two or three jobs before I became a, a parliamentarian. So it's very, very important we've got that skills skilled workforce. And uh, I think uh, the, 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 the people who are part and the organization who are part of PACE are, are really working behind the scene and all year round about this because let's not forget it's a partnership and it's that work. It's uh, the, 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 the partnership. Uh, this is important, President Officer. We need to have the facilities and the people to retrain and upskill our folks, uh, our workforce and it's what this uh, government is doing. This col collaborative approach works very well because this government understands businesses and how they work. For example, the business trade relief package from this government is making uh, the, uh, the Scotland the best place to do business in the UK. The Scottish Government initiative for responding to redundancy of the situation is strong and delivers for people when and where they need it the most. Please With this government's course. business, support policies, business in Scotland keep on growing and thriving. Presiding officer. Many thanks. I now call Paul Martin to be followed by Linda Fabiani. Presenting officer, I, like others, uh, welcome uh, this opportunity to speak in this debate uh, this afternoon. Uh, and, like others, recognise the uh, good work of the PACE scheme. Uh, it does help people back into employment. But, of course, I think it should go uh, without saying that we should be looking at all of the resources that's available to us uh, in Scotland, whether it's through the Scottish Government, whether it's through the Westminster Government, whether it's through our local authorities. Uh, it should be something we all agree on. Uh, that when people are faced with a redundancy uh, situation that we provide uh, that expertise uh, and support. And I think touching on the point that Drew Smith raised that I think if you're faced with a position uh, of potential unemployment, what people wouldn't want to see us doing here today is debating a congratulatory motion. Uh, they would want us to improve uh, the possibilities of them uh, gaining employment. And I think that's what we should look at today. And in Glasgow, there have been a number of examples of, government serv of companies serving redundancy notice on their employers. Uh, last year, on Christmas Day, uh, nearly 2,500 workers at CityLink received the news that the company were going into administration. And 165 of those workers were based in Scotland, many of them uh, in the east end of Glasgow. One aspect I don't think we have debated today, and that is the impact on the local economy. Uh, of these redundancies, as in the case of CityLink, uh, we've seen the negative impact on the uh, local community, particularly in the East End. And I think that's an aspect of uh, PACE's work that I would welcome some feedback from uh, the Minister that should be considered. That's how we, of course, support those who, who are served with potential uh, redundancies, but also look at how we can support the local community who face many of the challenges uh, during that uh, process. Uh, another example I'd point to in my constituency was the International uh, Clothing Retail Group, uh, who are based in the Queensland Industrial Estate. Last year, the management uh, stopped uh, operations uh, with a loss of over 40 jobs. And desperate staff were told that they had no entitlements, uh, no redundancy payments were brought forward. And I've got to say, President Officer, if it weren't for the intervention of the USDAW union, 
uh, then the plight of the workers would have been much known, more negative than it resulted in. And I think we should pay tribute to the role of trade unions, the important role that they play in this partnership in ensuring that people do receive the advice that they receive. Now, that was a loss of 40 jobs uh, in that organisation, and I can't recall PACE being involved uh, in that position. So I wonder, and I would welcome some feedback from the Minister in his closing statement, uh, what the threshold is for intervention. Uh, and I would welcome some feedback on that and how we can do it. And I say it in a constructive way because uh, I think there are, yep, taking an intervention. Ken Robertson. Uh, I'm very grateful to the member for taking a brief intervention. The member uh, <coughs> uh, congratulate the work that Stephen Boyd does from STUC. And he's been uh, working in partnership with the government and uh, the the conference in last February, he was part of that workshop looking at how to develop uh, the, the partnership working within government and local authorities. Paul Martin. Because, you know, so I think Dennis Robertson makes a good point, but when we look at the intervention and the role that the trade unions play, I think it should also be recognised that significant resources are required from uh, the unions to play that part. Uh, and perhaps in the, in the spirit of ensuring that that partnership can continue, then the government can maybe consider what resources can be provided to the unions to ensure that they can provide that supportive role uh, that they play. And that's something that I would also expect the Minister in his concluding remarks to refer to at the same time. Uh, also, can I also, uh, you know, uh, touch on the point that's been made uh, in respect, I think many members have touched on this today, and that's the prevention of potential redundancies. I think the point that Adam Ingram made in respect to the situation that people found themselves in USC was well amplified by Adam Ingram. And I think he made some powerful points, particularly in relation to, I know he referred to, to Mike Ashley, there are many other individuals and companies who play the system and they look at the opportunities that are available to them uh, to play the system. It's not just in respect to the tax system, there's many other aspects of current law where these individuals play the system. They call themselves employers, they call themselves investors. I think they should hang their heads in shame uh, in some of the practices that have been followed by these individuals who reinvent themselves uh, almost on a daily basis to look at other op potential uh, asset stripping opportunities that are available to them. And I think whatever government is able to intervene in this, whether it be uh, in the Scottish Government, whether it be in the Westminster Government, whether it be in local government, wherever we can uh, provide support to potential, uh, uh, to, to provide support to employees who find themselves in this position, then we should do that. Uh, and we should at every opportunity highlight these examples uh, of these individuals who should hang their heads of shame and we should look at what action is available for us to take in that respect. Can I just say in conclusion, President Officer, I think this has in many ways uh, been an important debate to highlight uh, some of the challenges that people face every day and I think Drew Smith made that point uh, very well. Uh, I don't think we should just congratulate ourselves for everything that uh, we've done so far. We should take it as read that those resources and that should support should always be there to who, the people who find themselves in that position. And not just those who face the redundancy position, but also the communities who face those challenges uh, as a result of those companies that have gone into administration. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to call Linda Fabiani. Linda, is the, Linda Fabiani is the last speaker in the open debate. Uh, I note there's a number of people who've contributed to the open debate who are not in the chamber. I would expect them to be there by the closing speeches. Linda Fabiani, six minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's certainly been a, a really interesting debate, and a lot of people have contributed. And I think Paul Martin's last statement there sums it up, really. When, when things um, like uh, redundancies, whether large-scale, small-scale, or individuals, uh, happen, it doesn't just affect that person. It affects their family. It affects their wider community. And sometimes it can uh, devastate entire communities. Um, that's why I think it's so important that, that something like the Partnership Action for Continuing Employment exists. And the fact that it is a partnership action is so very, very important and includes all people. So there's really um, you know, nothing at all in the, the government motion here that I would take issue with. Uh, though I was interested in, in Mark MacDonald's point, which was um, further spoken about by my colleague Dennis Robertson, about you know that issue about early interventions fine of course we need early intervention but sometimes you can end up with self-fulfilling prophecies if you are seen uh, to be too quickly talking about things like what's coming to an end to redundancies 
having worked in the construction trade for a while, we very often did see that happen when the rumour mill started about uh, things going wrong. But it is... Yes, of course. Bruce Smith. I'm, I'm grateful to her because um, a number of members have made that point this afternoon and I understand where they're coming from on it. But surely the... the, the, the well, certainly my point is uh, employers who uh, know that they may be putting their employees at risk of redundancy have a duty to engage with services. They have a duty to approach government and make clear that the action should be put in place to minimise that risk for those individuals. Linda Fabia. Absolutely, presiding officer. There is nothing in that statement I can disagree with. Uh, all I would suggest is that that's perhaps why the S2UC were so disappointed uh, when the Smith Commission um, stuff came out, uh, followed by the draft clauses, uh, when aspects of employment law at least could have been transferred to Scotland so that we can work with trade unions, that we can be a beacon for the rest of the UK as to how employment law should be operated. That's what I would like to see happen. True partnership working. Um, I mean, we've already established a, a fair work convention, uh, and that is so important. Working for people's rights with trade unions. I mean, we look what's happening at Westminster. Uh, you know, the UK government trying to end check-off facilities, um, reducing trade union facility time. We should be standing against it up here. And one way we can do that is saying, give us the powers, we'll take them, and we'll work for the good of people generally. That's what I would like to see. But then I looked at the, the Labour Party um, amendment, and I'm not quite sure why... why even listening to Lewis MacDonald, why the need was felt uh, to put down an amendment like this. Um, PACE was originally created with a remit to ensure early identification. Yes, that's happening. Um, to undertake partnership working, that's happening. It's happening all the time. But the bit that really intrigued me uh, was the establishment of a resilience fund. And Murdo Fraser mentioned that. I think what Murdo Fraser said was that until he could hear what this resilience fund was actually for, um, he, he would not uh, commit to whether or not he agreed with it. I'm even more confused by the Labour group than, than Murdo Fraser is, and I don't mind admitting it, because what I want to know, to, um, I think it's Siobhan McMahon that's closing the debate, is, is this the same resilience fund that's going to help the health service? Is it the same resilience fund that's going to help local government? Is it the same resilience fund that's going to help with the oil industry? Or are we going to have resilience funds for every single sector um, that exists in Scotland? Or are we just going to have a resilience fund every time there's a headline wanted uh, in a national paper? I, I would appreciate a response to that. Uh, one of the things that I, I thought uh, was interesting that the Minister said when he was talking about helping businesses before crunch point was the ability to have, for example, HMRC on board and defer payments because very often as constituency MPs we do get calls from business, generally small businesses, that are having issues around that and it's good that the PACE team can help with that. Um, the Minister also asked for suggestions, and one of the things that I find quite frustrating at times is when you have a sole trader or a very small business who has hit a trough. And it's things like, if you could really do that joined up thing of, for example, the benefit system being able to kick in to help people over a bad time and then be looked at and made up later. What is the point of making people unemployed and putting them in benefits if maybe six, eight weeks down the line, the business is picking up again. Sometimes businesses end up going out of business because there isn't joined up thinking right across sectors. The last thing I would say, presiding officer, is um, Margaret McCulloch made a very good speech and talked about how PACE had helped uh, in East Kilbride. And certainly when Freescale went down as well, the local college um, was working with the PACE team to help in that. Margaret mentioned Rolls-Royce, and yes, we have issues there about people leaving and relocating from East Kilbride. A task force was set up for that. East Kilbride task force headed up by South Lanarkshire Council. Can I ask, Minister, uh, that despite letters from the then Cabinet Secretary back in July about uh, the Council engaging more with elected representatives. Seven months on, nothing has happened. Could I ask that um, the Minister agrees 
to look into East Kilbride Task Force, see what's happening and perhaps suggest to the local authority that we should be working in partnership, that we are all working together and it's for, for the good of the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms Fabiani. I'm now moving to the closing speeches. Before I call Alex Johnson, can I uh, just note that Chick Brodie, who contributed to the debate, is not back in the chamber. I'm sorry, you are. My apologies, Mr Brodie. How could I possibly have missed you? Alex Johnson, six minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted that Chick Brodie has made it back. I was going to mention him, and it would have been lost had he not been here. However, members will have observed that there is no Conservative amendment today, uh, and they should not be surprised, because on this issue, as with many others, if we can keep the whole issue of Scottish independence off the agenda, I find myself uh, more or less in agreement uh, with the Minister. We heard at the beginning of this uh, debate from Murdo, Murdo Fraser, who pointed out that Scotland's economy is strong. Like the rest of the UK, we are seeing improvements in the number of people employed, reductions in unemployment, and we are beginning to see wages rise once again. It is against that backdrop that we have this unusual position uh, we are in at the moment. Now, when we debated independence, I and many others uh, on, in this Parliament took the position that we were opposed to separation because of the risk of shocks to key sectors. Now, little did we know that there was a shock to a key sector coming very, very soon after that referendum. The slowdown in the oil and gas industry, uh, driven by the reduction in prices, has demonstrated the risk that we find ourselves under. Now, the North Sea oil and gas industry, as based in Aberdeen, it does find itself in a doubly unusual position in that many of those employed by companies in that area now operate outside the North Sea sector altogether. So we could find that the level of uh, shock that goes through that industry may well be periodical and it may come at different times in different areas. Yes, briefly. Uh, thanks, Member, to taking the information. You know, to a certain extent, he said that we are better together when the shock happens. Can the Member tell us what the Westminster government has done? Because so far, he's done nothing at all. We are waiting for the Chancellor to take that decision. He needs to take it, and he needs to take it now. The UK uh, government has been cutting taxes since it came to power in 2010. The UK government has ensured that we have passed through a period when, to the surprise of many, there were record levels of investment in the North Sea. What the UK government is doing today is ensuring that public expenditure in Scotland remains consistent year on year at a time when, if we were reliant on oil revenues, that simply would not have been possible. Now, let me go on and talk a bit about the Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, the subject of this debate. The reason why we will be supporting the Government motion tonight is that we agree with the Government that PACE are providing a good service, well regarded and improving its expertise over time. It is, in fact, the case that the work that has been done by Margaret Souter and her 18 teams across Scotland has demonstrated itself to be effective and it improves in its effectiveness as it understands better the marketplace in which it operates. But that marketplace does change, and it changes regularly. In fact, this is the mention for Chick Brodie, uh, he came up with an oxymoron today. He said that change is a constant. And I think it was an excellent example of the, the practice, because I agree with Chick, the only constant is that we are in perpetual change. Unlike Drew Smith, perhaps, whose speech at one point seemed to deteriorate into a demand that no one should ever be made redundant, ever, uh, perhaps under the Drew Smith leadership, we might have seen a, a long-term result that would have kept our coal industry, kept our steel industry, kept our shipbuilding industry, and today we could walk across the Clyde uh, on the backs of unsold ships. But nevertheless, change is a constant, and that's why we have to have organ an organisation like PACE which is assisting where that change requires to be managed. 
We heard at some length from Margaret McCulloch in an excellent speech in which she talked about her own experience with Jay's plant, uh, and that was highly relevant and a demonstration of one of the positives. We've also had positives, perhaps, in the work that's been done over the years with Halls of Broxburn and more recently with CityLink. In Adam Ingram's contribution, which was also uh, very constructive, John, he talked about the Johnny Walker plant in Kilmarnock and how work was, work was successfully carried out to ensure the minimum of redundancies when that bottling plant closed. But he also told us some horror stories. He talked about the companies that were involved in the open cast coal mining industry and how they exited it at very short notice. He also uh, recounted the story of the USC plant at Dundonald and the horror stories associated with that. So we've had no shortage of examples of where PACE have worked very constructively with employers to minimise the impact of closures or downsizing. But we've also heard examples of companies which have not taken the opportunity they had to avail themselves of this service. There was also a suggestion made uh, on more than one occasion in this debate that early intervention was the answer. And of course, we all know early intervention is extremely important. But there was another point made by Mark MacDonald, and that was that we cannot see every job as a potential redundancy. And if we go about thinking that every job is a redundancy that hasn't happened yet, then we ourselves could undermine the marketplace that, as I said at the outset, is growing, is improving, is creating jobs, and is actually reducing unemployment month on month. The Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, PACE, is providing a great deal of expertise. It is improving its expertise over time, and at the moment, it appears to be adequately funding funded, calling into question the demands by the Labour Amendment to bring forward a resilience fund. So for that reason, when decision time comes, we will be supporting the Government's motion on this matter. I now call on Siobhan McMahon. Ms McMahon, about seven minutes. Thank you. President Officer, this afternoon's debate has been a useful one. I'm pleased that the Government wished to draw the work of PACE to the attention of the Chamber today. PACE is something we normally talk about in written or oral questions. When a member questions the government ministers, or indeed the first minister, on the support being offered to constituents who are being made redundant, the response will inevitably involve PACE. As we have heard this afternoon, PACE was established in 2000 and was originally intended to play a role in preventing closures, redundancies, as well as dealing with the consequences. For far too long, we have seen the focus shift from prevention to mitigation. That is regrettable. If the role of PACE in prevention has been or is being replaced by another agency, that would be one thing. I don't think that anyone would have a problem with a strategy that involves prevention and another for mitigation. But as we have heard this afternoon, this isn't the case. Unfortunately, the government have been concentrating their efforts on mitigation, and the results of this are not always what we wish to see. I would be interested to know what role... Yes? Donald? I'm not clear that that has been the implication that's been given from the government or indeed from members who've made contributions. No business in my constituency that's had interaction with PACE has suggested that they have not had appropriate support either at early intervention stage or at redundancy stage. So I'm curious as to where the member has drawn that inference from. I don't know if the member was here for Paul Martin's speech, which proved the example that if in fact that intervention had happened in one of the businesses in his constituency, we might have seen a different outcome. So that would be the example um, I'm drawn for. So I would be interested to know what role PACE has played in seeking to prevent recent closures, redundancies, and how successful they have been in this role. At the PACE Summit in 2009, entitled to Working Together to Address Redundancies, Partnership, Prevention and Programmes, the ministerial commitment was the need for PACE to become a proactive force for the anticipation and prevention of company closures and redundancies. Can I ask the Minister if this is still the case? I would also be interested to know when the next PACE Summit will be held and what issues the Minister believes will be addressed then. In addition to this, delegates at the summit agreed that a proactive approach helping people from work to work would yield more positive results and to support this, retraining and upskilling needs to happen earlier within workplaces prior to redundancies taking place. Given that it is now six years since that summit took place, can the Minister, in summing up, tell the Chamber what progress has been made in relation to this. 
In the Pace Clients Experience Survey of 2014, which was commissioned by Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Government, there was little mention of the prevention strategy that was spoken so highly of during the 2009 summit by the then Cabinet Secretary for Education, Fiona Hislop. In fact, the findings of the report were quite concerning. For instance, the survey found that more than one-fifth of those who had received a career guidance interview or information about training and funding sources expressed concern that it had come too late. Of course, this was not a new finding, as the same thing had been found in the 2012 Client Experience Survey. Not only is it concerning that the same problems are being experienced by those using PACE two years on from when the original problem was identified, it is also concerning to note that the problem is getting worse and not better. The report states, the PACE presentation and guide is received by the largest proportion of clients and often represents the first contact that an individual has with PACE. Around one quarter of new clients who attended the presentation felt, felt that this had come too late in the redundancy process. 23% of respondents reported that this was the case, which was an increase from the 2012, where 17% of those attending expressed this view. Given that the report does not shine light on anything new, but in fact clearly reinforces the point about prevention, a point first brought to the Government's attention in 2009, and the greater need for its workplaces that are at risk of redundancy, it begs the question what the Government are doing about this matter. Now, I know that the Government may say that there is only so much they can do to make pace the PACE model work, and I accept that to a point. I fully accept that in order for the government to be able to have control over prevention, they need the help from the employers, a point that the minister made in his opening speech and a point that was reinforced by Adam Ingram in his speech. But the model that we are currently working with requires employers to notify agencies prior to announcement of redundancies in order for it to be able to work. Given that this really happens, I have to ask, is it the Scottish Government's aspiration for PACE simply one of helping people into new jobs? And if it is not, what are they doing to either change the model or their interaction with the employers? In addition to this flaw in the current model, the 2014 client survey also provided further worrying data. For example, only 45% said that PACE had some influence on their move back into employment, and only 8% stated that it had made all the difference. Not only does this mark a fall from 2012, where the figure was 53 per cent, it is extremely concerning that less than half of clients that think that PACE has made an impact on them getting a new job. In fact, the survey found that the top response when asked their views on the benefits of PACE services was, don't know, at 20 per cent, and the third most popular answer was no benefit at 15 per cent of respondents. The fact that PACE's main objective is to secure future employment or training opportunities for people, it seems to be failing those it seeks to serve. The good news for the survey was that around three quarters of clients had secured some form of employment. However, what we do not know from this figure, a figure that is to be welcomed, is what direct role PACE had in helping secure that employment. Did the PACE team set up the interviews, inform the client of the interviews, help write the CVs, give them interview tips? Or was the job found by the client themselves or through a different agency? We do not have the statistics to answer this, but it is something that should be reported in such a survey. In fact, this was called for in the evaluation document commissioned by SDS following the pay support offered by, uh, to the former employees at Halls and Broxburn. In the recommendation at the end of the document, it said that it was worth exploring whether or not it is possible to establish a client tracking um, to capture output system. There are a number of options here, including undertaking a survey of redundant workers and using HMRC data. I would be interested to know if the Government have looked at developing such a model since this recommendation um, was put there. As we have heard from Liam MacArthur and Margaret McCulloch, from the client survey, two-fifths of clients moved into a job with lower skill requirements than the previous position. This figure has decreased from the 47 per cent figure that was reported in 2012. That is good news. However, it is disappointing to note that it is still occurring at such high numbers. Therefore, it would be interesting to know what steps PACE and their partners have taken to address this. Finally, President Officer, the 2014 survey contained information in relation to the way in which clients received information. It was found that one in eight people, 12 per cent, had accessed any online PACE support, and only one in 20, 6 per cent, had accessed the PACE contact centre helpline. It is clear that more has to be done to promote these services to users. Therefore, I would be interested to know if an ad campaign or something similar will be run to promote such services in the future. I feel that I should conclude my speech with the main ask from the respondents to the survey. 
They have suggested some improvements to the current system and I hope that this could be achieved for future service users. These recommendations are a more personalised service, longer and more frequent help sessions and a more timely point of intervention, interaction to start earlier in the redundancy process. Scottish Labour also has its own recommendation which we have put to the Scottish Government and that is the Resilience Fund. We believe that this would provide an additional tool for local authorities and their partners which would help local economies threatened by a job crisis. The example given by Margaret McCulloch and Paul Martin and the speech made by Drew Smith, particularly around the issue of continuity of work, shows that this fund could help in those circumstances in partnership with what is already on offer. Today has been an important debate and one that leaves us with many questions about PACE and the support on offer. I hope the Minister will be able to answer some of these in his summing up. Thank you. Can I now call on Fergus Ewing to wind up? Uh, Minister, till 5.30, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I, I'm grateful to members in making this a, a constructive debate and I think uh, several thoughtful and uh, informative uh, contributions from all parties in the Chamber. So I record my thanks. And I'd like just to start where I began with my opening comments, Presiding Officer, and that is just to, to repeat that the experience of redundancy is one which is one of the worst life has to offer for a great many people which has horrendous financial consequences, but perhaps even more so the emotional or human or uh, uh, mental consequences which it can cause to families who suffer the situation, particularly if the sole breadwinner suffering a redundancy, I think puts enormous strain on individuals and families. And I, I just say that because it's obvious, isn't it? But it's very easy to lose sight of in the maelstrom of points that are made about how together we tackle it. That is the starting point. That is the central point from the, from the perspective of people who have been made redundant. Adam Ingram mentioned that he himself had been made redundant twice. Perhaps uh, we are the exception in this chamber that many of us have been fortunate enough not to have suffered that experience. But I know from my own family that those who have, that it's, this is a very, very difficult experience and therefore it behoves us very well to respond as best we can, as efficiently as we can, uh, and using taxpayers' money as efficiently as we can as well. And I wanted really to touch on a point that Mr. MacArthur made and perhaps hinting that the, there was an element of self-congratulation in the tone of the motion. If that's the case, I'm entirely responsible for that and it was not something that I intended to convey whatsoever. There is nothing more off-putting to the public than politicians congratulating themselves for achievements, real or imaginary. Uh, and that is not the spirit of this debate, signing officer. The spirit of this debate is very much, as Mr. MacArthur said, for me to learn from the contributions today what improvements, what further improvements can be made. And that's uh, a point that I make, and I undertake that myself and Margaret Souter and other officials in the Scottish Government and Scottish Enterprise will reflect on the contributions today seriously, and there are many and varied, so I probably won't have time to, to comment on them all. Uh, yes, I certainly will. MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the, to the Minister for taking an intervention and for his, uh, the, the start of his closing remarks. The description he gave of the impact of redundancy clearly uh, matters little, whether it's a large-scale redundancy or whether it's small-scale. The impact on the breadwinner and the immediate family uh, can be equally severe. Is there a minimum threshold be, below which PACE cannot operate, as you'll appreciate, in communities such as mine? Uh, a relatively small absolute number of job losses can have a pretty devastating effect on the, uh, on the economy and on the community. Minister? Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to answer that point. I think, incidentally, Mr Martin raised exactly the same point. Uh, there is no threshold. PACE is available for everybody. PACE is available for one person that's been laid off. But that does lead me on to an area where I think we can make improvements. And Murdo Fraser touched on this in his opening remarks, and that is this, that in order for PACE to reach out and be able to assist people who have been made redundant, they need to know about the redundancies. If they are, if they are not made aware of them, then by definition, they are not able to offer help. Help may not always be sought. Many people will find alternative joint employment or opportunities themselves. Many people prefer to do that, actually. Uh, however, a large number will not and perhaps do not get that help at the moment. And therefore, Mr Fraser's suggestion that we further use uh, business representative bodies and perhaps trade representative bodies who perhaps uh, may have a closer relationship with their membership than the generality of the Chamber, the FSB, the IOD, the CBI and so on, 
uh, we need further to reach out for them. Two of the bodies, the FSB and the Chambers, are amongst the 21 PACE partners. And incidentally, I hold meetings with them roughly biannually of the partners to discuss together how in practical terms we can make improvements in this regard. And this is uh, something we're doing already, I should say to Mr. Fraser. We do regularly ask the uh, business bodies for their cooperation, and that is given in a fulsome fashion. We also reach out, need to reach out to small businesses and make them aware, and I think we all have a duty here. I counted in the Chamber, presiding officer, I guess this is normally your terrain, but I counted there was about 22 members during the debate, and I think almost every single one has been in contact with my office at some point about redundancies in their constituency. I couldn't actually identify anyone that hadn't. Uh, so therefore, this is a, something that affects everybody. And all of us have an ability to inform uh, businesses, especially small businesses, that PACE exists, that it exists to help, and it exists to help everyone. Uh, it is also true that early notice to PACE can assist. For example, in my former constituency, when I represented La Habre, there was, if you like, a model process of closure if there can be such a thing, if that's not a contradiction. And that was by British Alcan when they decided to, uh, to concentrate activities between Fort William and Kinlochleave, and they embarked on a five-year plan. They gave five years' notice to staff, and it was a model of investment and consideration for staff in the light of a business decision that had serious consequences. Sadly, the other end of the spectrum was uh, clearly... Uh, uh, and graphically described by Adam Ingram in, I thought, the, perhaps the, the uh, most uh, uh, interesting contribution of this debate when he described the quite appalling behaviour of Mr Mike Ashley of Sports Direct and repeated the phrase which was famous, as some of the older members will remember, in the 70s and said, Mr Ashley is truly the unacceptable face of capitalism. And I think Mr. Mr. Ingram's contribution is a reminder that, fortunately, there are relatively few cases like that. Almost all the cases that members bring to me are cases where employers and insolvency petitioners are working together to try to do the best in a difficult situation. But just occasionally, there is one that is not, and that was described very well indeed by Mr. Ingram. One of the topics in the debate, the presiding officer, that dominated, and I would like to, to comment on, is early intervention. Uh, and I'm afraid that I here must disagree with my colleagues in the Labour Party. I believe that there is an absolutely correct focus on early intervention and moreover that this is a function that is discharged extremely well by the enterprise network. Uh, and I say that and I can give details to, further details to members uh, but I know from my personal knowledge and Mr Swinney uh, beside me here from his more extensive knowledge uh, there is a huge effort, day and daily, put in by a number of devoted public servants in the enterprise network, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and Scottish Development International, to tackling very difficult situations. But you see, the reality was highlighted by Mark Macdonald when he pointed out that companies that face some financial problems cannot make those issues public Otherwise, they will then find that their banking terms, their customers, their creditors uh, will react in a way which exacerbates those problems and perhaps even brings about the most difficult situation of insolvency that these efforts are intended to solve. I think the better approach, presiding officer, rather than sort of vague and generalised criticism of our public servants, which is not particularly helpful or productive, is for suggestions of specific actions which we may take or which we may do more of, which perhaps we're not doing at the current time. Presiding officer, I think my remarks are, uh, must be drawn to a close, and I would just like to, to uh, finish by repeating my and Mr Swinney's recognition of the extraordinarily successful efforts and well-intentioned efforts of a huge number of people led by Margaret Souter in the PACE teams throughout the country. I know that they go the extra mile to try to help people in Scotland who face the appalling and harrowing situation of suddenly finding that their, their services, their livelihood is terminated, is at an end. 
And I think it's perhaps the human side, the human face of that effort that has resulted in the resounding vote of confidence from the vast majority of the people who have been recipients of the PACE service in this country. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, PACE, supporting individuals out of redundancy into employment. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 12164 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. On behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revised business programme for the week, any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12164. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12164, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that amendment number 12154.1, in the name of Lewis MacDonald, which seeks to amend motion number 12154, in the name of Fergus Ewing, on partnership action for continuing employment, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12154.1 in the name of Lewis MacDonald is as follows. Yes, 34. No, 78. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at motion number 12154 in the name of Fergus Ewing on partnership action for continuing employment be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.